and we must move on to questions to the Minister for Justice. And I call Mr. Cahill Washing. Mr. Washing. Question one. Deputy Speaker, the failure of the latest political agreement to come to a position on legacy mechanisms and provide significant additional resources makes progress on legacy inquests more difficult. I very much appreciate the disappointment that this will cause victims. My objective is to deliver as much as I can for families, and consequently I have agreed to the Northern Ireland Courts and Tribunals Service launching a recruitment scheme with a view to appointing investigative support for the coroner's service. The scheme was launched yesterday, and I would expect appointments to be made by the spring of next year. The cost of appointing such investigators will result in the further unfunded legacy pressure on my department. Motion for supplementary. Uh, go back to ask, can I ask and waste an I thank the Minister for his answer. But does the Minister agree me, uh, with me that the current inquest process is not providing access to a sufficiently effective investigation with an acceptable uh, timeline? For a well, Mr. Oshin makes uh, a point which has a number of different factors to it. There certainly are problems at the moment around the issue of resourcing for the coroner's service. Uh, there are also issues which have affected a number of legacy issues uh, where matters have been engaged which require clarification from uh, the police or from the Ministry of Defence, uh, particularly where national security issues are engaged. What I am determined to do is to put the, the maximum possible resources into the coroner's service. And good work has been done in that particular area uh, by strengthening the complement of coroners, uh, by assigning judges from higher court tiers uh, to deal with coroners' cases. But clearly, uh, until we resolve the fundamental issue of the necessary resourcing, we will not have all being done as fast as we would wish. I call Mr Danny Kennedy for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his uh, earlier answers? In view of the fact that the King's Mills families and the sole survivor, Mr Alan Black, have waited almost 40 years for the reopening of the coroner's inquest into the cruel murder of their loved ones, can the Minister assure the House that the timeline now being indicated by the coroner's service will be adhered to, and will he join me in expressing the hope that this matter can and will be addressed after such a very long period? Well, I thank Mr Kennedy for his question. I certainly can join him in hoping that the matter will be resolved very speedily. Um, I am aware that in the particular case of the Kings Mills inquest, uh, a preliminary hearing has recently been held and a further one is due to be held before Christmas time. Uh, the intention is certainly to proceed uh, if matters can be strengthened at that preliminary hearing uh, during the first half of 2016 to proceed to the full hearing. And it is interesting that this is one of those cases which is now uh, being uh, looked after by Judge Sherrod, one of the higher court uh, judges who has been moved across in to assist the coroner's service, an example of the resources which are being put in by the DOJ, which are currently unfunded, but which I hope will produce results for the families concerned. Call Mr. Patsy McGloan. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Um, just on this particular matter, is there a realistic chance, could the Minister inform the House, of those 56 outstanding legacy inquests being completed, or in fact, uh, within a reasonable period of time, or in fact being completed at all? Well, like Mr. Oshin, uh, Mr. McGloan has put a number of different questions within one particular point. Uh, at the moment, as I suspect a number of members will be aware, uh, the Lord Chief Justice, having assumed the presidency of the coroner's courts uh, in line with an assembly decision uh, when the bill became an act uh, late last year, uh, has uh, instructed one of the senior judges to review all of those outstanding 56 cases. Uh, that is likely to lead to a hearing by Lord Justice Weir in each of them in the month of January, and that will then establish the position uh, for all of those cases and which ones are in a position to move forward speedily and which ones may take longer or which create difficulties. But there are difficulties around disclosure matters, as members will know, uh, which are causing delay in a number of them. I certainly hope that it will be possible to see a number progress, and I'm determined that we will put the resources in if the resources can be made available. At this stage, however, I do not have all the funding which is required to do all that I would wish. 
Oh, Mr. Stuart Dixon for supplementary. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Uh, can I congratulate you on uh, appointing the, or moving the process forward with regards to the appointment of coroner's investigators? But can I ask, is that appointment, or the, are those appointments at the expense of other aspects of the justice system, or will you be able to avail of additional funds to follow through on those appointments and to support the cost of those appointments into the future? Well, at the, at the moment, Deputy Speaker, those posts are being funded from within the DOJ budget, though they are clearly related to legacy issues. And members will recall that a year ago there was a promise from the Prime Minister of funding to deal with legacy matters. But at this stage, we have not seen the additional funding that we would need coming forward, and therefore it is at risk to the Department of Justice. Nonetheless, I am determined to see that we will make progress within the inquest system, and therefore funding is being put from the Department's current limited budget for today into dealing with the past. Well, Mrs. Joanne Dobson for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number two. Deputy Speaker, the £160 million additional funding provided by the Treasury for the next five years is to support the PSNI in addressing the continuing severe national security threat as well as to provide greater capability to tackle continued paramilitary activity and criminality. This amount is based on an assessment by the PSNI of its requirements over the next five years, that is 2016-17 to 2020-21. During the four-year budget 2011-15 period, additional security funding of £199.5 million was made available to the PSNI by the UK Government. This was fully used by the PSNI except for £5 million in 2012-13, when easements of this amount in other areas were redirected to security funding. In the current year, a total of £31 million of additional security funding has been made available to the PSNI by the UK Government. This will be fully utilised by the 31st of March 2016. Mr Dobson for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer and ask um, what steps does the Minister plan to take in terms of allocating resources to ensure that the situation in Mugabri Prison is addressed and that staffing levels are increased to ensure the prison officers regain control? I must say, Deputy Speaker, I'm used to inventive supplementaries but I'm not quite sure what the relevance of the supplementary is to the question that was asked in the first place. But I do have to respond to the last point that Mrs. Dobson made. There is not an issue of prison officers regaining control of Mugabri Prison. Mugabri Prison is controlled by the Governor and the staff and not by anybody else. Call Ms. Megan Fearn for a supplementary. Can I get last King Corley? I hope the Minister is happy with my own supplementary, but I would like to ask the Minister if he would consider allocating some of the £160 million to reinstate the rural crime unit so that we can more effectively tackle crimes against farmers in rural areas. Um, I, I'm certainly uh, going to accept that that's a, re a reasonable question in the current context. Um, the only issue is that that money is allocated directly to the PSNI to deal with major security issues. And whilst uh, concerns have been expressed, including yesterday in the chamber, <coughs> relating to rural crime, I doubt whether there is anything of the sort of issues which have been dealt with um, in terms of rural crime which comes within that security area. But it is for the Chief Constable to decide the allocation of that resource. Well, Mr Jim Allister for supplementary. So the situation is that in the four years 2011 to 15, 199 million of extra national security mon money came. This year, something of the order of 31 million has come, and for the next four years, 32 million per, for the next five years, 32 million per year is to come. Isn't it quite clear, therefore, that bundling that together to claim 160 million as a result of a fresh start document was a piece of window dressing and pretense for this was money which was coming our way in any event? Well, Mr. Alice is aware that I'm as critical as many members of this House of the so-called Fresh Start document, but it is a matter of fact that I have reported on. Uh, he correctly highlights the amount of additional security funding being provided in this year and the amount which is being provided for the coming five years. My understanding is 
uh, that when uh, the PSNI made its request to the government, it came to a total of £161 million over five years, and £160 million is being provided. But of course, there are significant issues which are yet to be resolved within the budget process, uh, which I I don't believe my department has yet received information from the DFP as to what will be expected uh, to look to the budget process for the police, both for security matters and for other matters, as well as for other aspects of the justice system. Well, Mr. Alex Easton for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number three. There have been ongoing staffing pressures brought about by departures from the Northern Ireland Prison Service and high sickness levels. This service has kept staffing levels under review and worked to maximise the use of existing resources through the use of staff redeployment and continued robust management of and support for absentees. A reprofiling exercise looking comprehensively at operational staffing levels across the service has been completed and representatives of the Prison Officers Association were consulted prior to the introduction of those new profiles. The new profiles were agreed and introduced on a phased basis in all three establishments in October and early November. Over the last four years, many staff have left the service, but NIPS has also recruited new officers. These new officers now have two to three years of prison experience and have valued staff working in all three establishments. The prison service launched a further recruitment campaign for custody prison officers and night custody officers on the 26th of October, and over 1,700 applications were received. Well, Mr. Easton for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister to maybe go into more specifics what uh, his department doing to tackle the sickness record in a sensitive manner, which is adding to the staff pressures? Well, the management of sickness absence is a, is a matter for line management in every part of my department. Certainly, in the specific context which members will be aware of, of very high sickness levels in McGabry, uh, Phil Ragg, the uh, current governor, has taken a very close interest in that issue. Uh, he and unit managers have been robustly examining the issues, with the result, as I reported uh, most recently to the Assembly, uh, numbers of staff who were sick on any day recently have been under half of those who were running sick in the spring of this year. So that obviously has a major impact to the benefit of the regime to ensure that prisoners are better looked after, have their needs met for things like phone calls at times that their families are expecting them, and is contributing to significant improvement in the atmosphere in the prison. Ms. Rosie McCarley for supplementary. I'm Gura Mayogat, Alaskan Koryogas, Gumbwist and Ira, Sir Agri Gujisha. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And could I ask the Minister, does he agree that staff levels in the separated regime are outdated, disproportionate, and unnecessary? And that this, the overstaffing in Roe and Bush house, houses leads to understaffing in the rest of Mugabri and undermines the attempt to uh, have a regime with purposeful activity at its, as its core? Gura Mayogat. Well, Ms. McCauley is undoubtedly right that staffing ratios are higher uh, amongst the separated prisoners in both Roe and Bush uh, than they are in other parts of the prison. But it is, of course, an issue of managing the risk and ensuring appropriate supervision levels depending upon the category of prisoners in different parts of the prison estate. Um, I certainly am not going to agree with her that there are excessive numbers there, but it is an ongoing issue to ensure that numbers are right and that ratios are managed well. And that ties down to the implementation of the August 2010 agreement and ensuring that the threats to prison officers, which are made both inside Row House and in social media, are removed in order that we can manage the prison better for the good of all. Call Mr. Leslie Cree for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I would like to ask the Minister what steps he is taking to engage with the Prison Officers Association to address the issues of poor staff morale and in particular with regards to the pay arrangements for custody officers. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, I engage with the Prisoners of Prison Officers Association when I am requested to engage with them. Uh, senior members of prison management engage with them as appropriate at both unit level and at headquarters level. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I have not received a request for any engagement from the POA for a considerable period of time, and I certainly responded to the last request I received. So the issue of managing staff, of dealing with staff morale, of looking at issues like pay uh, and allowances are issues for management and do not require ministerial engagement all the time, but I'm certainly happy to engage if I'm requested to. 
call Mr. Alban McGuinness for a question. Uh, question number four, Deputy Speaker. With permission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I will take questions 4, 7, 9 and 15 together. I am extremely uh, disappointed that the issues of legacy were excluded from the recent political agreement. Whilst there is progress in certain areas, the failure to address or make a commitment to the, le the legacy institutions set out in the Stormont House Agreement leaves a major hole in how we address the issues of our past. There are immediate as well as potential long-term implications for the justice system and also for the families of victims of troubles-related deaths. Without the establishment of the HIU, the responsibility for carrying out legacy investigations remains with those existing bodies involved in this important work. A key ingredient of the Stormont House Agreement's approach to dealing with the past was the £150 million funding that was promised over a five-year period to fund new legacy structures and arrangements. I met with the Secretary of State last Monday on legacy matters. At the meeting, I raised a number of issues of concern, including with the UK Government's obligations under the ECHR, the implications of non-agreement for victims, the financial implications of managing legacy issues without the new institutions, and funding for existing legacy institutions. The failure to agree to the establishment of the HIU means that there are significant burdens that fall to my department. These legacy issues are much wider than the remit of my department, and the responsibility of dealing with them lies with the executive and the government. There is no do-nothing solution. In the absence of political agreement on dealing with the past, it is crucial that existing structures are adequately funded to fill the gap. Without the necessary additional resources to address outstanding troubles-related deaths, we will be failing the families of victims and failing to meet our obligations under the European Convention on Human Rights. We will be potentially throwing away the best opportunity for a generation to resolve issues of dealing with our troubled past. Well, Mr. McGuinness, for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for a very detailed reply? which I agree with much of what the Minister has said and the failure in the recent talks to uh, agree in relation to the HIU uh, was, uh, 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 leaves a terrible gap uh, in dealing with the past. Uh, is the Minister telling the House that in terms of the PSNI dealing with legacy issues that there is no additional funding uh, coming to the PSNI, either from the department or through the department, uh, from uh, the British government. Is that the position, or is some of the monies that was at least notionally committed during the course of the talks by the British government, that at least some of those monies can come forward to assist the PSNI, at least in the interim period? Well, I thank Mr McGuinness for that supplementary, which puts his, his finger on the very significant issue. Uh, there is at this point no additional funding for the PSNI. There is at this point no additional funding for the police ombudsman. There is at this point no additional funding for legacy inquests. I have made the point strenuously to the Secretary of State, though it is not a matter solely for the Secretary of State, it is an issue which also engages the executive. But given that the government was promising £150 million for legacy institutions, there are major questions about the responsibility that the government has to deal with those issues in the absence of the legacy institutions. And certainly there were to be no new institutions for inquests, and the police and the ombudsman have to carry out functions, including functions which at times are court-ordered or ordered by the DPP, uh, in the absence of a particular funding. That is simply not sustainable to expect them to deal with the past on the budget for the present and there will need to be an arrangement to find that funding if we are to meet the needs of the victims of the past. Mr Little, your question has been answered. Do you wish to ask a supplementary? Yeah. Yes, please, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for his stark warning uh, of the implications of failing to adequately deal with the past and indeed fund the institutions that are required to do so. Can he provide any insight into where the blockage on delivery of a comprehensive mechanism for legacy issues lies, and does he believe that the UK government will honour its responsibility to adequately fund existing structures in order to ensure that victims and survivors get access to the information, uh, justice and services that they deserve? Well, I thank my colleague for that expansion of Mr McGuinness's point. Um, it is not, I suppose, easy to define where blockages currently sit. Um, in fairness to the Secretary of State, 
I know that she has said that the money that was committed by the Treasury is still committed if legacy institutions are established. The challenge is uh, that the work has to be done whether or not legacy issues are, uh, institutions are established, and issues as, such as those which will be dealt with in inquests would be done without new institutions. So I believe that the commitment which was made by the Treasury on the back of the engagement with the Prime Minister a year ago uh, shows that there was a recognition that the work had to be done. And at the end of the day, the obligations under ECHR are obligations for the state party, even though they're carried out by devolved institutions, and it will be the UK government that will answer in Strasbourg and other international fora if it fails to provide the necessary resources. Call Mr. Jerry Kelly. I thank the Minister uh, for his comprehensive uh, um, answer, and, 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 and let me agree with him that there, the option of uh, doing nothing is not an option as far as the victims and survivors are concerned. Would he agree with me that the, the lack of disclosure, which I think he mentioned earlier, by various agencies of the British Government, including the PSNI, uh, two families and indeed two inquests and, and other courts, is a huge issue? and that justice delayed, and in some cases this has been for a number of decades, is justice uh, denied? Well, I thank Mr Kelly for the question. I'm not sure that he and I would necessarily have an identical view on issues of national security, um, but there are difficult issues which need to be worked through in that particular uh, area. There is no doubt that there are a number of legacy inquests where there are not concerns about national security and where it should be possible to make progress. And I welcome the work which has been done by the Lord Chief Justice and is currently being done by Lord Justice Weir to carry through uh, the examination of the state of each of those potential inquests. Uh, the provision of the additional resources uh, at judicial level, um, including the provision of a High Court, coroner to, uh, High Court judge to take forward the role of a coroner in one complex inquest, uh, the work which I've already highlighted being done by Judge Sherrod you know, in another one, and the, uh, the examination of the whole package uh, as one by a single judge in January will, I believe, be, be very beneficial. But clearly, there will be issues, and I will certainly be continuing to engage on the issues of, dis of disclosure and how that is carried through in order that we can best meet the needs of families. Call Mr Paul Gervin. Question number five. <coughs> Again, Mr Deputy Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions 5, 8 and 13 together. The Bar Council and the Law Society have challenged the remuneration for Crown Court cases introduced in May by way of judicial review. In addition, the Criminal Bar Association and a number of solicitors' firms have decided not to represent their clients for work which will be paid under the new fees. The High Court judgment ruled against my department on two specific areas, namely the absence of a trial preparation fee for solicitors and the way in which my department undertook its regulatory impact assessments. The judge did not strike down the rules as the, application, as the applicants had sought. My officials continue to meet with members of both sides of the profession to discuss a range of legal aid issues, including Crown Court fees. Further meetings have taken place since the judgment. I also met representatives of the Bar Council and the Law Society last week when both advised that they were considering an appeal. I have made it clear to the professional bodies that I am prepared to listen to any reasonable proposition and to consider adjustments when real issues are identified. In the meantime, my officials are developing specific proposals to address the judicial review finding in respect of guilty plea fees for solicitors, which will be subject to consultation with the profession and will be brought before the Justice Committee in the new year. Proposals are already at an advanced stage to introduce provisions to remunerate those cases which fall outside the standard fee regime, and my officials will present these to the Justice Committee this week. We will also ensure that these changes and any future reforms are subject to a more rigorous regulatory assessment. The actions taken by members of the legal profession are inevitably impacting on the operation of the Crown Courts, and this is regrettable. It will take some time for the cases currently being affected by the action to progress through the courts, and many areas of the justice system will need to work together to ensure these cases are progressed without further undue delay. I would encourage all members of the legal profession to re-engage in defending their clients to ensure that they receive the appropriate access to justice to which they are entitled. This will also ensure that victims and witnesses are not subjected to any future unnecessary delays in seeing their cases progressed. Call Mr. Gervin for a supplementary. 
thank the Minister for his very detailed answer. Uh, I just want to ask in relation to the fees which were proposed and been put forward, what, what is the comparison to what is happening in other regions of the United Kingdom uh, in relation to the tariff that is to be paid to legal firms and to barristers and solicitors? Well, the, the key issue seems to be, uh, as it relates to barristers at the present time, um, where there are very simple comparisons. The original proposals uh, were compared on a value-for-money basis as part of the legislative requirement against fees paid for similar work in England and Wales, which is the most comparable jurisdiction. The original proposals established uh, that the, uh, the fees paid were roughly 40 per cent higher than those in England and Wales. After various discussions and various ameliorations, the proposal is to reduce the fees to barristers by 22 per cent, still leaving a significant margin over those which are paid in England and Wales. Well, Mr. Conor Murphy. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Does, I mean, this is a, a difficulty which is, is creating a somewhat of a mess and undermining confidence that the system is delivering effective and efficient justice. What plans are, can he see? Any plans that can be put in place to step up dialogue with the uh, Bar Society and the legal profession uh, to try and ensure that this impasse is brought to an end and a proper solution is found? Well, I agree with Mr Murphy. We need to see the impasse ended. That's why last week I met both the Law Society and the Bar Council directly. Uh, I have uh, made clear that the judgment which related to one issue uh, in terms of solicitors' trial preparation fees was being addressed urgently and, as I say, will be with the, the committee this week. Uh, I also am in the process of making a specific offer to deal with a, a couple of areas of difficulty to barristers, but in the context where, uh, first of all, a High Court decision upheld, except for the one minor issue of fees for solicitors and the issue of regulatory impact assessments, upheld entirely the proposals from the Department, which were backed by the Assembly as being entirely valid. But there is a challenge now, I understand, being made in terms of an appeal against the Judicial Review decision. It is difficult to engage on the substance of the matter, though I am keen to see that any of these minor anomalies are addressed as fast as possible. Well, Mr. Fergal McKinney. The issue here that justice is now not being served as a result of the considerable tension within this dispute, and uh, hasn't it gone beyond the point of urging barristers to continue to represent their clients? And isn't it, this, isn't it the situation that the department should be taking the initiative to attempt to resolve this in order that justice be served? Well, it's certainly the point that the Department should be taking the initiative. If you look at the record of the work which has been done by the Department, I believe the Department has been taking the initiative all the way through, um, including seeking the recent meetings. But the reality is uh, the High Court upheld in all but one minor respect the rules that were, uh, that were put in place by the Assembly. And in that context, on the basis of value for money, availability of finance, uh, that is the you know, that is the position as it stands. If the Court of Appeal were to overturn the decision of the High Court, then that would put us in a different place. But at this stage, I am operating on the basis of assembly policy as validated by the High Court. Mr. Jim Allister. Can the Minister confirm, is it the case that the current level of logjam in terms of criminal cases is something of the order of 1,000 cases piled up and unattended to in our Crown Court? And if the Minister is saying there will be no meaningful eng engagement until the outcome of the appeal, isn't that situation going to spiral even further out of control? Well, certainly the figures that I had, Mr Deputy Speaker, were of somewhat less than 1,000 cases. Um, the last figures I saw were something in the region of between six and 700 cases waiting. Um, I accept the last week may have seen a slight increase, but I doubt whether it's either at 1,000 or spiralling out of control. But the issue is the appropriate decisions were taken by the Department of Justice after lengthy discussions with solicitors and barristers, supported by the Assembly. There was no attempt in the Assembly to pray against those rules and upheld, except in one marginal area and one procedural area, by the High Court. 
time for one very brief question from Ms. Pam Cameron. Deputy Speaker, I welcome the 16 Days of Action campaign and the public focus it brings to the important issue of domestic violence and abuse. I have instructed officials to consider and introduce a number of initiatives, including domestic violence protection orders, domestic homicide reviews, special listing arrangements, the potential of a domestic violence disclosure scheme, and a possible offence that captions patterns of coercive and controlling behaviour in intimate and familial relationships. Such initiatives will require resources and details will become more apparent during their development. I remain focused on taking forward these and current priorities associated with domestic violence and abuse. However, we need to be realistic that the current funding constraints will impact on what new work can be developed and delivered. I'm afraid there's not time for a supplementary because that ends the period for list of questions. We will now move on to topical questions. I call Mr. Phil Flanagan. The Minister has advised me that a, a prisoner was remanded into custody um, in Hyde Bank Wood on the 30th of November. Um, and that this individual has identified as being transgender um, and is accommodated in Ash House, which is the, the female facility in the north. Um, and according to the Minister, this is the only uh, transgender prisoner in the last five years. Can the Minister advise uh, the House um, how the particular needs of this and um, any other transgender patient or transgender prisoners uh, will be met by the prison service? Well, I should first of all, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, repeat to Mr Flanagan and to the House my apology that I gave him a written answer to a question which was accurate at the time that there had been no transgender prisoners admitted to custody in Northern Ireland um, and before it became the current date of that answer one was admitted. Uh, the simple answer to that is that the individual self-identified and was living as female and was therefore admitted to Ash House in Hyde Bank Wood because that was a reasonable and pragmatic approach being taken by the prison service to meet the needs of that individual. The precise details of exactly how she is being cared for in Ash House, I believe, should not be gone into. Flanagan for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer and, and, and do accept the, the, the apology that he has given, but I, I do not really see the need for it. It was an administrative error, um, and I, I fully accept that. But I am not. Uh, asking the Minister to get into the specifics of an individual case. Um, but what we have seen, particularly in places like Britain, is uh, transgender prisoners being put into to solitary confinement um, to try and deal with this solution. Does the Minister accept that, that such an approach is not the way um, to deal with the, the, the particular needs of transgender prisoners and that the approach that uh, he, he says the prison service has taken is a, a much more uh, beneficial one? Well, I thank Mr Flanagan for that supplementary. Uh, I certainly believe that the approach which has been taken by the Northern Ireland Prison Service is significantly better than that which was taken by the National Offender Management Service in England, uh, where members will be aware there have been two recent suicides of transgender prisoners. I believe it was pragmatic and reasonable, and certainly I don't think there's any question of somebody being put into solitary confinement for other than the most extreme of reasons. There is no question of that simply because somebody is a transgender prisoner. And I believe the supervision ratios in Ash House are adequate to ensure that the needs of every prisoner are met, to ensure that there can be no question of any kind of risk to individuals. Mrs. Sandra Overend for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister uh, if he could provide an assessment or an estimate at this early stage of the number of prisoners who will be granted a uh, parole this Christmas? Uh, I'm afraid I can't at this stage, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. It's an administrative issue within the prison service. Um, I have been known in the past to report immediately after Christmas on the numbers who, who were given Christmas leave um, and indeed uh, whether any of them returned late and sometimes some of them return early. But I'm afraid uh, the figures are not available to me at this stage as to the numbers who have applied or the numbers who will be granted. This is over and for supplementary. Uh, thank you and thank the Minister. I'm sure we'll, we'll question the Minister again in the new year regarding that. But I, I wonder could the Minister add his weight to the process and ensure that all paperwork is in order, uh, all checks and balances are in place for, uh, for releases and, importantly, the returns. And uh, importantly, as an issue that I've raised with the Minister before, ensure that victims and relevant families are informed uh, of each prisoner that's being released. 
Well, amid the joking about Christmas, there is a very serious point there from Mrs. Overend, which I entirely accept. Um, there have been difficulties in the past about information not being provided uh, to those uh, victims who have um, asked to be informed of what is happening to, uh, to those who committed offences against them or against a loved one. It is a key issue which needs to be dealt with by the prison service adequately, and I would do my best to ensure that that is the case this year, not just for Christmas, but for the future. Mr. Sean Rogers, for Th Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, could you give us an update on the education services within Hyde Bank, and particularly the progress at turning it into a college? Sorry, I'm slightly shocked, Deputy Speaker, by such a positive question. Um, I'm, um, I, I also think that perhaps my colleague, the Minister for Employment and Learning, should also be here at the moment. Uh, there has been very significant progress made since the decision uh, that Hyde Bank would be, would be redesignated as a college earlier this year. Uh, certainly, the outsourcing of the education responsibility uh, to, in the case of Hyde Bank and, and also McGabry to Belfast Metropolitan College and to the Northwest College in the case of McGilligan, since I shouldn't just allow only Hyde Bank to be mentioned, has, in my opinion, gone extremely well, considering the difficulties sometimes of putting different organisations together. There's been a very significant contribution by the providers, and I think we've seen very positive results from that. There's no doubt that we now have a situation that well over 90 per cent of the young men are engaged in some constructive activity, generally leading to a qualification on a daily basis, and that is a huge and significant statement. And I don't know whether I've, I've said it in the Assembly Chamber before, but I've certainly said it elsewhere. One well, of the nicest compliments was from one of the chaplains who said to me, it used to be if you wanted to see one of the boys, you went and looked for him on his landing. Now you don't know where he is because he's out doing something useful. And I think that is a major statement of a massive change. Uh, certainly, as one who uh, had a very enjoyable, um, though larger than I normally have at lunchtime, Christmas lunch in the cabin last week, uh, we see some very good work being done. Um, I would recommend to members that if they haven't yet bought all the Christmas presents they're thinking of, they could try the barn at Hyde Bank up to this weekend, where there's a variety of crafts uh, which have been made by prisoners, uh, both male and female, in Hyde Bank for sale. It is all an example of good positive engagement on which the outsourcing of learning and skills has been very significant. Just for a positive supplementary. Yes, I will continue the positivity. Could I thank you for that, Minister? In terms of the young people when they leave um, Hyde Bank, obviously integrating into the community is very important. Um, can you, what assurances can you give us that the, the education programmes that, that they partake in Hyde Bank are continued when they go back into the community? And again, that's a very significant part of the rehabilitation. The, one of the key benefits of the outsourcing uh, of uh, employment and learning uh, to the colleges is it enables courses to be run in line with what is being carried on in outside institutions and therefore makes it easier that for somebody leaving the prison, they can find a place in a relevant college course more or less where they were. We will not guarantee it always works easily, but that is much better than the course which is being run entirely independently by prison service and which did not uh, carry through easily into the community. So it is very significant. We should also of course, be reminded that the numbers of young men in High Bank Wood have been reducing significantly, and that has to some extent made it easier to provide better courses and better options for them. Just the same as, um, incidentally, the numbers of uh, children and young people in Woodlands in the Juvenile Justice Centre is also going down. So that is part of the wider reform programme of the justice system to stop people coming in. But I do believe that in terms of education and training, we are doing much better for young men when they leave. Mr. Cathal Washington for a topical question. Good morning, but, uh, let's go shorter than the end of the positivity there. Could I ask uh, the Minister if he, uh, uh, that uh, the loss of the Quakers to the prison visitor experience cannot be, well, does he agree that maybe it cannot be uh, evaluated purely in monetary terms? Well, I accept that there are issues uh, relating to the way in which the visitor centre service was provided at the three prisons, including the very significant service that was provided for many years, I think four decades, by Quaker service at McGabry. Um, Given that a solicitor's letter has been received on the issue of the awarding of the new contract, I don't feel I can go any further than that, but I'm certainly happy to praise the good work that they have done over the years. Mr. Washing for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for, for, for that, but does he agree with me that the cut of the cost has undervalued the work of the Quakers? Well, 
I'm sorry, Deputy Speaker, but I really think that is the area which I cannot go into, given that there is the potential for legal action. But I certainly value the work which was done previously. Well, Mr. Rosie McCarley for topical question. And, uh, uh, can I uh, ask the Minister, uh, in relation to the uh, recent CJI report, uh, there was a call within it which called for greater collaboration between the PSNI and the PPS, and uh, the point of that was to address uh, significant failings in the preparation of case files and uh, the standards applied around disclosure. Can I ask the Minister what steps he plans to take to address that? Well, this is one of those uh, questions, Deputy Speaker, where I need to be st uh, slightly careful. Ms. McCauley has correctly identified there is a significant issue, and it is an issue for the DOJ in terms of the wider efforts we are making to speed up justice. But I need to be careful about directly getting involved in the specific recommendations for the PSNI and the PPS. What I am aware of is the fact that, as is so often the case, uh, Sijini reports are published uh, after a period of time when work to uh, address some of the issues which have been highlighted is already underway. And I do think improvements are being made. But clearly, there's a very sig significant issue, which I think is largely founded on the reforms uh, which followed after the Good Friday Agreement, which emphasized uh, the ability to provide confidence in the justice system by showing the independence of different organizations. I believe we're now at the point where we need to much more emphasize the interdependence and working together, because that is the way we will show real confidence. As long as we have the operational independence fully uh, categorized and we have that, we could be emphasizing more the way people need to work together to improve the experience of victims and indeed also of defendants. Carly for supplementary. Thank the Minister for that answer. But could I ask the Minister if he has actually had any engagements with the Director of the PPS on this issue? I have not spoken to the Director specifically on this issue. I do meet the Director regularly, and these are the kind of issues which come up in general discussion, but not in the sense of me telling the Director what to do purely in the sense of the sort of work which is done when, for example, the director attends meetings with other leaders across the justice system in seeing how we improve our working practices. But it is that difficult balance between independence and interdependence. Mr. Stuart Dixon for a topical question. Um, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, you will be aware from uh, letters which members will have been sending to you with regards to delays in access, the production of access NI certificates for people uh, to allow them to uh, do work, both voluntary and employment. Um, some concern has been expressed by the backlog uh, with regards to the PSNI in delivering uh, this access clearance. Minister, can you update the House on what is happening with regards to PSNI and access certificates? Again, I thank my colleague for that question. There is no doubt that a while ago there were significant concerns about delays in access and eye check processing, especially for those issues which need to be referred to the police whether PSNI or another body uh, for examination. Uh, I believe uh, the turnaround times for those checks which are dealt with purely by XSNI have by and large been quite good, although it ha it's not been unknown in the past that people have complained about slow processing when employers hadn't forwarded the paperwork anyway. The fact that we've now got issues being dealt with online by individuals is making a significant improvement in that. Um, but in, in the specific issue of police checks, uh, the statistics that I had showed that in June there were 789 checks which had been waiting with the police for over 60 days, and at the end of November that was reduced to 54, a reduction of something like, well, something over 90 per cent, which is clearly a significant improvement and clearly much to be welcomed, sitting alongside the fact that Access and I is now significantly exceeding all its targets for the timescale for issuing checks. Excellent for supplementary. Thank you. Can I uh, obviously welcome that information with regards to the, the reduction in the time taken? And can we be assured, Minister, that Access NI uh, not only have clear targets, but that they meet or exceed those targets into the future in order to allow people to get employment or to continue in voluntary work? 
Well, I certainly hope that will be the case, Deputy Speaker. Uh, we've seen very significant progress. There were issues in terms of the staffing uh, within uh, the police service, uh, and there were changes of staffing, but I think we've now seen the good work being done uh, by the new police staff in enhancing the service which they provide very significantly. And just in terms of the, the most recent statistics that I have for the month of October, they merit repeating. For basic checks, Access and I have returned 99.6% within 14 days. The target is 95%. For standard, 99.7% against the target of 95% within 14 days. And for an enhanced 98.8% within 28 days against the target of 90%. All of those show extremely good work being done by Access and I and also by the PSNI. Order time is up. That concludes question time. I